My name is Perry Small, and I am a native of Chicago. I always knew that I wanted to work in media. I think for a minute there, I thought I wanted to be in front of a camera, but I knew that I was a better writer. And so I found out about a position as a producer at WVON, and I had, I, broadcasting was never my thing. But I had developed such great skills working in the mayor's office, and I knew what, what it would probably take to succeed there. And I was their first executive producer. And at that time, I was producing the morning drive, which was from 5 to 10. We didn't have internet. We didn't have cell phones. And I just excelled at it. I, just, I always just had a great nose for news. And while I was there, they used to ask, they said, oh, Perry, you should be on the radio. I'm like, oh, no, absolutely not. But on Saturday mornings, they gave me a show again at five o'clock in the morning. And it was called uh, Small Talk. And, um, and then I got fired from WVON the first time. Don't ask me why. I think I started some kind of mutiny or something. And uh, I didn't work for about I honestly didn't work for about eight years. Wow. And I didn't work for eight years, Maudlin, was because I was a full-blown drug addict, entitled, and was burned out. And when the time came for me to go back to work, I called Mr. Garth. <laughs> he hired me again. And that was a time when, uh, if you had a job in radio or television, that's all you did. And I kind of was ahead of my time. And I was doing Lou Palmer's uh, night show on WVON and doing that in the day. And Mr. Garth didn't like it. And he asked him that because now you do everything. Right. He didn't like the idea that I was doing that show. Yeah. And he brought me into his office and he said, he says, either you're going to work for here for me or you're going to work for WVON. And I said, well, this is my two week notice, have a great life. And I started working for WVON. I, I struggled with addiction for more than 30 years. I was a full fledged cocaine addict, starting probably when I started working in the mayor's office. Difference was modeling, everybody was doing cocaine back in the 80s. I just liked it and kept it moving and everybody else stopped. And the question is not why I became an addict. The question should be how is it that I couldn't have been with all of the alcoholism and mental health issues that have plagued my family. Well, the point when I knew I was done mm -hmm. was after my dad died, who was my safety net in every, I never had to take care of myself. If I lost a job, so what? My car note's gonna get paid. I'm gonna still get a new car. I'm gonna still have nice clothes and a great place to live. Because, because daddy. daddy was still there. And I tell people this all the time, Marlon. It took my father to die for me to become the woman that I was supposed to be. He died on what day? It was the darkest day of my life. I had to take him off life support. And he was at Mercy Hospital. And I remember coming out of the hospital after he had been pronounced dead and the snow was falling it's a beautiful beautiful slow, quiet slow snow it must have been about seven o'clock in the evening and I just remember being so broken and so afraid because I'm like you can't take care of yourself and I remember falling in the snow next to my car face down and I said, this is it, I want to die. And one day, Melody said, uh, Melody Span Cooper, the owner of WVON, we had a staff meeting. And they asked everybody to go around, the, it was in Ju July, go around the room and tell people what you're grateful for. And she gets to me and I'm sitting there thinking about how I'm going to get my next hit. Can't wait for the meeting to be over. And they said, what are you grateful for, Perry? And I said, absolutely nothing. She says, I want to see you upstairs when this meeting is over. I'm like, okay, what, what can you do? Fire me? Go right ahead. 
care less. What's the point? Went upstairs and she looked at me and she says, I'm not losing you. Because we're friends. More, we were friends. I mean, she's my boss, but she's my friend too. She says, I'm not going to lose you. She says, I know what you're doing. She said, everybody knows what you're doing. I said, whatever. Melody's on the phone. She's just dialing everybody. She's like, I'm not losing you. She call, she's calling Governor Quinn's office. Call. Where can I send this girl to get some help? Wow. They said, okay, we got a place for her. Wow. They sent me to Rockford. So I was waiting for the call about when I was supposed to go and everything for rehab. Went there, did my 30 days. I knew I was going to come home and I was going to drink. I knew I was going to get high again. And I did. I thought I had it under control. I thought I could hide it, right? You know, I'm looking a little healthy and all of that. So then... Uh, they started making me drop, take a uh, blood, a uh, drug test. Uh, that her name was Brenda, that used to, you know, drug test me. So they gave me a drug test. The first one I passed it. I said, "Wow, I can get high tonight." So I went and got high. So then um, another, they gave me another test. They never told me when they were, and when they gave me uh, that test, I failed it, and. You know, they told her that period failed the test. Then there was another one. So then I would pass the test and then I would fail the test. And Melody sent me a letter. I wish I kept it. She says, if you fail one more drug test, you're out of here. I've done everything I can. They had me a life coach, all that stuff. And I said, okay. So it was the day before the six month anniversary of the six months that I was out of rehab. And they gave me a drug test and I passed. And I said, praise the Lord, I can go home, honey. Then I can just get high. All right, so I went home to get high. And the next day, my program director said, it's your six-month anniversary. You need to take another drug test. I'm like, that's it. I'm screwed. I was so overcome and overwhelmed and something just... And my spirit just was different. I got home and I got on my knees. And I said, God, if you get my exact, I said, if you get me out of this shit, I said, I promise you, I'll never pick up again. I mean, I was screaming to the heavens. And I, I'd already gotten to the point where it wasn't any fun anymore and I didn't even like it and I didn't even like it how it made me feel. And I got on my knees and I begged the Lord. I said, you get me out of this. I promise you, I will never pick up again. I never picked up again. I've been clean eight years. From that very From night. From that night. Did you drop the next day? I had dropped that day. The day that happened the day when I knew I had failed that test. I and know. Melody had told me, if you fail another and one. there was another one Let, coming. No, so didn't even have it. It didn't happen. It and didn't happen. And up guess that. what? That was God. Brenda never gave them the results of that test. Of that, oh, so you did do a drop. I had done the she drop. Never... She never gave them results. She told me because we used to go and smoke. Um, cigarettes in the warehouse. And she says, you know, you failed that test. I said, yeah, I know. I said, Brenda, I'm done. And I didn't say don't tell, but I had had a conversation with a higher power and I have never picked up again. No desire whatsoever. So let's get to your relationship with Alan. You get clean and you move in with Alan into this home. Mm -hmm. And so what was your relationship with your brother? Well, first of all, before that, tell us who Alan was. Oh, God. He is the most complicated person. But Alan was brilliant. Alan's sole purpose in life was to have fun. He was smart. Great vocabulary. We could, as long as we weren't talking about anything that had to do with us, we would have the best conversations in the world. But there was a sibling rivalry from the time we, he was born. 
But then my mother had a major stroke. He brought her, brought her into here, this home into to this live home. with him. Yes. And he became her caretaker. Chief caretaker. Yes. Talk about your moving into this home, your relationship. I hated it. Just the idea of it. You did not know anything about Alan's addiction. So let me tell you. So I just avoided it. I just being in the same space as Alan. And, you know, not long before he died, I told him, I said, you know what? You're the only person that takes away my happy. I said, you're the only person that takes away my happy. And I said, I'm tired of you bullying me. On May 15, 2015, I noticed things were unusually quiet. So I come downstairs to say good morning to my mother. And she's there, and I look in on his room, and... He was asleep, and uh, I said, well, he must be really tired. Because I did realize mm -hmm. and was grateful of how well he took care of my mother and how he spent time with my great aunt Annabelle, who usually, who later came into my care. So about three o'clock, I didn't hear all of the bustling and the combustion and the doors in and out and the, hearing him walking in his slippers. And, and as I came down the stairs, I smelled a distinct or odor of urine. You would have never have known that there was an old woman. I mean, my mother, he took such spick and span, house clean. We didn't have like, you know, diapers and that kind of stuff laying around. And I went, I opened up his door. And I said, Alan, I said, Alan, and then it hit me. He was in the same position as he was when I saw him that morning. My heart sank. My heart sank. I said, something's not right. So I went in and I, he's laying, he's looking all peaceful. He's got the smile on his face. He looks, I've never seen him look so peaceful. And I'm shaking him. I'm shaking, and then I notice he's cold to the touch. Mm -hmm. Then I notice he's stiff. Oh, Lord. He took my breath away. And then I realized that he had died. I thought, well, well, his heart probably gave up, gave out. Alan was overweight. He wasn't. He ate a lot of condiments and salt and stuff like that. I'm at work, and I get a phone call, and I answer it, and they said, is this Perry Small, Alan's small sister? I said, yes, this is Perry. We have the results from the coroner. Uh, of the cause of death of your brother. And I said, well, what was it? She said, acute heroin toxicity. I said, excuse me, I got to go to another room. I don't think I heard you correctly. And I went into the kitchen area and I said, could you say that again? She said, I'm, she said your brother died of acute heroin toxicity. I said, are you saying that my brother died of a heroin overdose? She said, yes, ma'am. Since I have come out with my own story of addiction and have been so honest about what my struggle was, you would be surprised of the people that call me in this city that might work in City Hall or might be a CEO or might sit on this board or might be an elected official said, Perry, I've got a brother. They've never reached out to anybody else, but they trust me. And whatever I can do to help them, I'll help them. But it was not only important for me to tell this secret, is that I want to change the narrative. You know what? Your, your child is no better than my brother. Wasn't brighter than my brother. Wasn't as you know, no more well-liked, none of that. If it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone, and God forbid you don't want it.